Hi, my name is Madison Huey and I'm receiving my Master's in Wildlife Conservation at BYU under the direction and mentorship of Dr. Loreen Alfin. Today I will be updating everyone on the monitoring of Castilea parvula, variety parvula, on herbivory from native and non-native herbivores here in the Tusher Mountains in Fish Lake National Forest. Here is a quick overview of the things that we will be discussing in our presentation today. First, I will introduce the Tusher Mountains, and inside of the Tusher Mountains, I'll talk about the rare endemic plant species that we find, more specifically, Castilea parvula. With Castilea parvula, I will discuss the palatability and the evidence that we have for this palatability. Then, I will discuss the exclosure plots and why we've put them out and what kind of information we want to discover from those. Then, I will talk about the information that we have discovered, and then I will give the conclusion slash take home of this whole presentation. The Tusher Mountains, located in Fish Lake National Forest in Beaver, Utah, is home to some pristine alpine habitat. This alpine habitat is incredibly important as it hosts 28 endemic alpine plant species. The Tusher Mountains are also the third highest mountain range here in Utah, and they have peaks over 12,000 feet in elevation. The Tusher Mountains are home to 28 endemic plant species in alpine communities. Within those 28, there are five that are considered high priority concerns. Of the five high priority concern plant species found in the Tusher Mountains, we are particularly interested in Castilea parvula var parvula and the family Scrapulariaceae. We are particularly interested in Castilea parvula because, like other Castilea species, this one appears to be extremely palatable. Here in the Tusher Mountains, we see Castilea utilized by mountain goats, elk, deer, cow, marmot, pika, and white-tailed rabbit. Everything seems to love this ice cream plant. Over the last four years, we have been looking at ungulate utilization on Castilea. This chart shows a quick preview of the trends that we're seeing. In here, I've included mountain goat, deer, elk, and random. We used random sites for comparison between feeding sites. So here in 2020 of mountain goat, we have 14 feeding sites that had Kappa or Castilea, and of those 14, 50% of them had been utilized with a mean percent utilization of 17.7%. Now, Kappa shows up more in feeding sites than it does in random sites, suggesting that, you know, there's a correlation there. And we've also found that it is the in the top 10 most utilized plant species found in mountain goat feeding sites and deer feeding sites. In addition to the observed feeding sites that we've recorded over the last four years, we have also monitored utilization at long-term monitoring sites for Castilea parvula. Here in this chart, if you look at Mount Holly and Poison Creek and follow them to percent of plants utilized in 2021, out of all the plants that, we've, that we measured, 88 of them were utilized in Mount Holly and 83% were utilized in Poison Creek. Now here in Mount Holly, that is the mountain goat core use area. This is where mountain goats spend all of their time and it makes a lot of sense as to why there's such a high percentage of utilization. Poison Creek also is very close to where mountain goats are. It's not the core use area, but it is a huge Castilea population site. So. If I was an ungulate and I wanted an ice cream plant, I would go there. So again, our research is showing that Castilea is incredibly palatable. So to cover all of our bases, we also ran fecal DNA analysis on all the various mammals in our study sites to look at the percentage of Castilea that makes up their diet. Now it's important to note that for Castilea to show up in fecal DNA analysis, it has to make up two to 5% of their diet. So in our elk samples, we have four elk that had Castilea in their fecals. We had 16 deer samples with Castilea, 35 mountain goats, four marmot samples, and in our marmot sample, we actually had one sample that had the highest amount of kappa in their diet comparative to everything else. We found two in pica samples, and we found one in a cow pie near the top of Delano, in the core use area where cows should not be. Because of the palatability of Castilea, we wanted to look at the effects of ungulates and small mammal herbivores on Castilea populations over time. 
To do this, we set up herbivore exclosure plots. We set these exclosure plots up in the growing season of 2020, and we set these plots up in pairs at long-term monitoring sites of Castilea. These long-term monitoring sites are Delano Holly Saddle, Poison Creek, Mount Holly, and Mud Lake. For one of the exclosure pairs, it excludes all ungulates. Here in this picture, you can see, you can, let me get my little laser. Here you can see the spaces in between that allows marmot and pika to go in there if they wish. Our next exclosure plot is a all herbivore excluded, where we have chicken wire and rocks at the base of the exclosure plot to keep everything out. In addition to our exclosure plots, we also have camera monitoring to look at the presence of herbivores near our exclosures, as well as to assess what herbivores can and cannot get into our exclosure plots. So far, we've found things such as chipmunks and mice can get into our exclosure plots, but the, nothing else has been in. So our chick, our chick wire is doing a great job. So with the herbivore exclosure plots that we put out, we wanted to specifically look at the above ground biomass for all species. We wanted to compare the numbers of Castilea parvula found in exclosure plots at different sites. And then we wanted to compare the most common plant species in exclosure plots at sites. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into those results, starting with the number of Castilea parvula in exclosure plots, starting at our Mud Lake site. Here, it is telling us a very distinct story. When you put an exclosure plot over Castilea that just excludes ungulates, the number of individuals skyrockets. Now you would expect that in all herbivores and ungulate onlys in a site like this that they would be very similar and that perhaps all herbivores would be higher than ungulate onlys, but that's not the case because the small mammals are not having the effect on Castilea here. It is the ungulates. Now this site is very unique as Ungulates in this site are not seen in other ones because this site is frequented by cows that are not supposed to be here. It is a lot lower elevation, so we get things such as elk, a lot more elk, and a lot more deer. We rarely see mountain goats here. So this site is really telling us a lot. Moving on from Mud Lake to Poison Creek Ridge, this site is very prolific in its Castilea. Um, and in this graph, it's telling the complete opposite story as to Mud Lake. So here you can see that Castilea individuals, their numbers increase in exclosures that ex exclude all herbivores. And that's completely drastically different than what we see here at Mud Lake where ungulates are having an effect, but here at Poison Creek Ridge, all herbivores are having an effect. So unfortunately, we were not able to compare Mount Holly and Delano Holly saddles as there was too few Castilea plants to compare. Um, this is in our core use area and the Castilea there are just hammered by the mountain goats. So it kind of, it makes a lot of sense as to why there's not a lot of Castilea there. However, we did find that Mount Holly in our Mount Holly long-term site, that we had one plant in the ungulate only exclosure in 2020, and that plant doubled to two plants in 2021. But in Delano Holly saddle long-term site, we had one plant in ungulates only exclosures in 2020, and we still only had one plant in 2021. So there's just some recovery time that's happening between our Castilea, but there's clearly a story that's happening here. To reiterate the story that we are seeing at Poison Creek Ridge, I've included this photo of a, our exclosure plots in Castilea that I saw this last summer. So here in this picture, you can see that the Castilea heads that are inside of the chick chicken wire are still intact, whereas the heads that were outside of the chicken wire are not. You guys see that? That's pretty crazy because what's safe inside the exclosure, it's good. Right outside of it, eaten, eaten down. Now let's take a closer look at a common species in our mud lake site, Poentella diversifolia, and how these exclosure plots influences them. Looking at the cover for Potentilla diversifolia and the all herbivore excluded plot, you can see that cover percentage is super high here. And this is what you would expect as an, an exclosure plot that is excluding everything, there's nothing being taken out. There's no ungulates or small mammal herbivores coming in and eating this plant. So cover is going to be high. 
Moving on to the utilization of Poentilla diversifolia and the exclosure plot that excluded ungulates, we have in 2021 no utilization. And in all herbivores excluded, we also have no utilization. Now, this is a little strange because in the exclosure plot that has all herbivores excluded, this is pretty predictable and what we would expect because everything is being excluded, you'd see no utilization. However, when you move to the ungulate only exclosure plot, you'd expect to see some type of utilization by small mammal herbivores, but you don't. This indicates that ungulates have a huge impact on the plant community here. It's a very interesting story. Finally, we're going to look at above ground biomass for all species across the four exclosure sites. Each graph is showing a similar pattern. Biomass is statistically significantly higher in exclosure plots that exclude all herbivores. Our data shows us that ungulates are not impacting biomass as much as we originally expected at our sites. Instead, we see that small mammals are the driving force for biomass at our four different sites. It will be exciting to see what continued sampling of our exposure plots will show. So in conclusion, we found that there is less herbivory and more Castilea parvula plants under exposure plots. We also found that there is higher cover and less utilization under exposure plots that excludes all herbivores. We found that Castilea parvula is recovering, in fact it's doubling in size, inside of exclosure plots. And our biggest takeaway is that small mammals have a significant impact on biomass and play a much bigger role than we originally thought in these alpine plant communities. Huge shout out to everybody that has helped with this project over the years, and a personal shout out to Steve Flinders for being the best biologist on the job. This project wouldn't be possible without all of you guys.